Well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Joe Radner and I welcome you on behalf of the program committee of the Charlotte Hobbs Memorial Library in Lovell to this next event in our summer speaker series. Um, a little bit of business before I introduce our speaker. Uh, I want to mention first of all that uh, we are on Zoom and um, our speaker will be spotlighted so that if you set your screen to speaker view, you will see him particularly. And if you set it to gallery view, you'll see all of us, which is another kind of pleasure. Uh, there will be a Q&A afterwards. People want to discuss Peter's uh, ideas and ask questions. So please, during the talk, feel free to put comments, questions in the chat. And when Peter is finished talking, which will be, I presume, before 8 o'clock, because we have just an hour, um, I will um, man the chat and pass on questions, and he will answer them. So uh, we will certainly have time to chat later on. Uh, this is a series. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of other things at the library. One is that there are still a few places left in our in our summer garden day camp, which is if you've been anywhere near the Lovell Library, you have seen vegetables growing and flowers. It is for children roughly five to eight, give or take a, a year. Um, and it will be August 16th to 20th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. For, for that week. And children will learn all kinds of things about gardening about harvesting, about plant life cycles, about composting, and of course about cooking and eating. So uh, if you know of a child who might be interested in that, please let them know and the information is all on the library website. Um, I guess I should also mention because it seems awkward but necessary that the next speaker in the series, uh, two weeks from tonight, on August 19th is, is I, uh, Joe Radner, giving a talk called Wit and Wisdom, a community tradition in 19th century New England villages, talking about a rather funny and powerful tradition that went on in the 19th century in Lovell and in this area and also inland New Hampshire uh, and Vermont. So that's a very different topic. And our summer speaker series is full of different topics. The whole point of this summer series is to introduce to people the resources, the fascinatingly diverse resources of knowledge and experience uh, among people who are in or very near and certainly well connected with Lovell. So, so far we've had, um, we've had Michael Sutherland, we've had Ruth Moore, we've had Maury Yip, and um, we have now, oh, and Emily Sano. And this evening we have yet another level person speaking on yet another different kind of topic, Peter Ellison. Uh, Peter and Pippi Ellison uh, bought their house in Lovell in 1986, and they've been here in all seasons, although not for too long at a time, because um, among other things, Peter has been busy. Um, he's been uh, teaching anthropology at Harvard since 1983. He has at various times been the chair of the Department of Anthropology, the dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. He has suffered awards ranging from a Guggenheim to just two years ago, the Franz Boas Lifetime Achievement Award from the Human Biology Association. He's been busy. But we're hoping that now that he is retired, he will have a chance with Pippi to spend more time in Lovell. You know, early in his life, he didn't intend to be a scientist. In college, he majored in philosophy, you know, um, exploring the meaning of the world uh, on a rather abstract plane, until one day he read Darwin's Origin of Species, 
learned about natural selection and everything changed. She said to me, the book was magnificent in its reach. He said, and it was absolutely true. It was as true as arithmetic. So he came down to earth very quickly and started taking every science course he could. Um, and true to Darwin, what Peter honed in on was um, human evolutionary biology. That is, you know, adaptations within that, adaptations in the human reproductive system, true to Darwin again. And his research has taken him to almost every continent. But then he turned also to the inquiry that brought him to our subject tonight. Uh, he got involved in the development of a new field, uh, evolutionary medicine, which unriddles questions about human health uh, and disease. We are lucky to have him. When I asked him, what do you find or what have you found most satisfying in your career? He didn't hesitate. He said, teaching, helping to generate excitement. He said, I love seeing lights go on in other people's eyes. So here we are on Zoom, you know, in little rectangles. <laughs> We've got a job. We're going to sparkle out of those rectangles. We will let the lights shine in our eyes as Peter Ellison tells us about evolutionary perspectives on COVID-19. COVID-19, there's nothing uh, more pertinent right now than that. Welcome, Peter. Talk to us. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I, I really am enjoying spending so much more time in Lovell than we've ever had a chance to during our working career. I know Pippi is as well. And it's a particular pleasure to try uh, and present some ideas to you all tonight. Um, I will confess that it's a bit strange to be doing so by speaking to a screen instead of to uh, live bodies, but I will do my best and I hope you will too. Um, I, there are two things I want to say at the outset. Oh, first, did I, th I thank Joe, but I didn't thank the library. I do want to thank the library for this opportunity and everyone on the program committee, and indeed everyone in the town of Lovell, which uh, seems to me a community that really uh, pulls together in the way a community should. Two things I want to say at the outset. First, I want to acknowledge that I am not a physician. I am not a doctor. I am not a virologist. Uh, my field is not public health. The expertise I bring to this topic is the expertise of an evolutionary biologist. And what I hope to convince you is that evolutionary theory has important things to say about human diseases and the things that have shaped our relationship with them. The second thing I would like to say starting off is that I'm gonna spare you all the mathematical details. There is a very rigorous mathematical treatment of evolution and all the ideas that I will be presenting today, but I'm not gonna try, nor would I be the best person to try uh, to present it in those terms. Rather, I will rely on common discursive logic to try to make my points. And I think that's appropriate. Um, the Origin of Species, the book that changed my life, uh, is perhaps the last great work of science to be written for the general readership population, not for specialists. Anyone can pick it up and have their life changed as I did. So I encourage you uh, to take that risk. So what is evolution? Evolution by natural selection is actually a pretty simple idea. It could be uh, summarized by saying that whenever there is biological variation that is heritable and some variants have either greater chances of survival or greater chances of reproduction than others, then those variants will spread in a population at the expense of those who have less uh, well adapted characteristics. We can use an example as I'm trying to present on this screen, where if you start at the left, you might imagine you have a, a population of 
pale butterflies or pale moths in a pale world. Uh, and perhaps a mutation occurs that allows for the appearance of a somewhat darker moth. Now that moth might stand out in the pale environment and be rapidly subject to predation, along with some of his pale relatives, so that the next generation might uh, not feature that uh, darker form. However, if that mutation were to occur again in a context in which the environment is becoming darker, as the background on the screen means to represent, then that darker form of the moth might have an advantage and might actually be less obvious to predators in the environment than his pale uh, cousins. And they might be the ones to be picked off. This uh, could translate into an advantage, a selective advantage, whereby the darker form is represented in succeeding generations in a higher proportion relative to the previous generation than are the light forms. And if that success continues as the, pop, as the environment gets darker and darker, we might end up with a situation in which all the moths are dark. Now, as this process occurs, it's uh, interesting to note that there are three things that govern how rapidly it will happen. One is the rate at which these mutations occur, the rate at which variation that might be useful in Darwin's phrase, uh, arises, there is the strength of the selective advantage that that variant might have over its competitors. And there is the generation time of the population, how quickly this organism reproduces, which will determine how quickly the changes can spread in the population. Now, this hypothetical example is in fact not really hypothetical. It uh, has happened in historical time, uh, particularly in uh, Britain, where a number of species of moths, which originally were rather light colored, became darker and darker during the Industrial Revolution as the trees on which they rested became darker and darker due to pollution uh, from the coal powered uh, industries surrounding them. So this, this kind of evolution uh, occurs as the environment changes. The environment selects for new forms of the organism. Now, this kind of evolutionary change clearly happens in the realm of human health. Uh, the example that we are probably all most familiar with is the evolution of uh, antibiotic resistance among bacterial populations. After generations of treating, anti, uh, treating bacterial infections with antibiotics, we've created a situation in which the only bacteria that end up surviving and propagating are the ones that are resistant to the antibi antibiotics that we use. Uh, this process happens so rapidly that now there are, uh, there are pathogenic organisms out there that are resistant to just about every antibiotic we have to throw at them. The antibiotics were originally natural, derived from plants and fungi, but increasingly are synthetic antibiotics generated in labs. Those labs are losing out in the race uh, for the, uh, to the bacteria that are developing antibacterial resistance. Now, when we think more deeply about disease organisms and how they evolve, uh, we immediately appreciate something different about disease organisms compared to moths. And that is that there are two levels of propagation, two levels of reproduction at which selection can occur. So if you are infected by uh, a pathogen, that pathogen will propagate within, within your body. It will spread in your body. Uh, replicating itself, infecting new cells, or if it's a bacteria, just spreading within your systems. And this process of internal reproduction, internal propagation, is the process that makes us sick. Uh, depending on uh, the qualities of the pathogen itself, um, what its pathophysiology is, which tissues it attacks, uh, which inflammatory processes it, it 
triggers. Uh, it can be more or less bad for us, but the propagation of that organism within our bodies is associated with an increase in the burden of disease that it presents. This process also depends a lot on the host, qualities of the host, including uh, how well our immune systems are working. The immune system being what, we, what our body uses to fight out against these pathogens. And the immune system uh, will vary in rather predictable ways according to some characteristics, such as age. We know that the immune system gets weaker in individuals as they grow older, uh, our nutritional status, the number of diseases we're simultaneously trying to handle, and so forth. Now, this process of this level of internal propagation then gives way to a process of external propagation, the transmission of this disease organisms to new hosts. This is the process that makes other people sick. This is the process that causes epidemics. And it has a the degree to which it occurs will have a lot to do with the environment and the mode of transmission of the disease organism. If it's rapidly transmitted uh, through the air or through water, then that propagation may occur very rapidly. If it's slow to propagate, if it requires intimate physical contact or just very low transmissibility, uh, then it will propagate more slowly. But these two levels of propagation, these two domains of propagation within bodies and between bodies, internal and external, within an individual versus spread within a population, is each associated with its own level of natural selection. So within a body, there can be variation in the disease organism. And if one variant propagates within the body more rapidly than the other, in this case, the green one propagates more rapidly than the red one, uh, it will likely be the case that the green one will have a higher probability of being transmitted to the next host than the red one. So there will be selection that depends on the rate of propagation within the body that will help uh, determine how this disease organism uh, uh, propagates itself. At the same time, there is a level of external selection associated with the process of propagation between bodies, the propagation within a population. So we can imagine two variants of a disease um, in two different bodies, uh, but with the same pathogen load in both bodies. So it's not that one of them is more prevalent than the other. One of them still may propagate itself more rapidly or more effectively or with higher certainty to new hosts than the other, in which case that organism with the higher propagation certainty or probability or rate uh, will be selected over the slower or less certain form. Okay, so there are two levels of propagation and two levels of natural selection that are possible. One of the chief insights of natural selection of, sorry, evolutionary theory is to point out that ordinarily these two processes are in a kind of balance. That is, that the rate at which the organism, the pathogen propagates between bodies sets a limit on how rapidly it can propagate within a body. The propagation within a body, remember, is what makes us sick. We're gonna to start to call that virulence. So the virulence, how virulent the organism is, is in large part determined by how transmissible it is. Now, if you think about that, uh, you can imagine a constant level of transmission. If, if there is an organism that propagates itself too slowly, it will be outcompeted by a variant that arises that propagates more rapidly. But if a variant propagates too rapidly, if it propagates within its host more rapidly than it can 
transmit to a new host. If the host in which it is propagating dies or recovers before it can transmit the disease, then that variant will die out. So it can be shown that there, for any given circumstance of external transmission, there is an optimal level of internal replication that is paired with it. And the organism will find that optimal uh, level. Now, there's some wonderful examples of this. One is uh, the Mixoma virus uh, that was used to control rabbit infestations, both in Australia and in Europe. The Mixoma virus was a quite lethal rabbit virus that in the laboratory was artificially selected to be hyper virulent, to be very, very deadly to any rabbit that infected. This was done in different laboratories, uh, developing different strains, genetically different variants of the organism that both had this effect of being highly, highly virulent. One strain was uh, introduced into rabbits that were released in Australia to spread the disease. The, uh, the other was introduced into rabbits that were released in Europe to spread the disease. Now, in both cases, within a very short period of time, that highly virulent form of the disease killed off almost all the rabbits that were infected by it. Uh, the ones that survived were those that had been infected by a much, much less virulent form. So as, as variation occurred within this organism, the only surviving forms were the much less virulent forms. And that can be seen in the graphs at the bottom. The interesting thing is that over the subsequent 40 years in both these locations, the organism, the pathogen resumed, re reacquired its virulence. And the virulence evolved to a level that was comparable to the virulence of the organism before the laboratory technicians had started to tinker with it, to the level that it was its natural match to its mode of transmission. This occurred both in Europe and in Australia, but by different genetic changes. So it wasn't in fact selection for any particular genetic changes, any particular tweaks in the proteins that make up this virus it was selection for a certain level of virulence. Okay, the fact that these two levels of selection are in balance with each other means that factors that change that balance, factors, for example, that increase the transmissibility of the disease, that increase the rate or probability at which it uh, is spread within a population, will change the optimal level of virulence. And if that, if that transmission rate increases, the optimal level of virulence will also increase. This can happen even if the starting level of virulence for the disease is exceptionally high. So the, the West African outbreak of Ebola in 2014 that grabbed the attention of public health officials around the world, including those of the Obama administration, uh, was bad enough as most Ebola outbreaks are because Ebola is a highly, highly lethal virus. But the mobility of the population that was affected and their rapid migration into parts of, out of Guinea into parts of Liberia and Sierra Leone and other parts of Guinea was associated with an increase in the virulence of the already highly virulent Ebola virus. Thus, as the conditions change to increase the spread of this virus and its ability to find new hosts to get into, increased its transmission probability, it increased a more virulent form, it evolved a more virulent form, uh, the A2V form designated on this graph. Okay, well, what kinds of changes or what kinds of factors might be associated with increasing the rate of transmissibility or the probability of transmission of an infectious organism? One of the most potent are vectors. Now, vectors can be 
animals, they can be insects, um, many of which we are very familiar with in Maine, like mosquitoes and ticks uh, and fleas that we might not be personally uh, acquainted with, but our pets certainly are. And vector insect and borne diseases and vector borne diseases in general are among some of the most virulent diseases that humans have to cope with. So clearly we're talking about malaria, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, yellow fever, uh, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, plague, and Black Death, all transmitted by vectors, which increase the probability that that organism is going to get from host to host. But vectors don't have to be animals. Water can be an exceptionally potent vector of waterborne pathogens like cholera and can cause, again, outbreaks of some of the most virulent pathogens to which humans are susceptible. Food preparation in our modern environment, especially if it is uh, food preparation done that is in a common area that is then going to be shared by a lot of people, can turn the food into vectors of disease, as uh, it does for norovirus. Uh, even machines like air conditioners can become vectors of disease, spreading them through uh, environments uh, like hotels uh, in the case of Legionnaire's disease. Even the doctors, nurses, and other hospital staff that take care of us when we are very sick can be vectors of disease. There's a whole class of hospital-acquired infections, otherwise known as uh, nosocomial infections, uh, which are all, as a class, very, very serious. Hospital-acquired staph infections can be almost impossible to eliminate. Uh, some of the most antibacteria, uh, antibiotic-resistant bugs that we have uh, are passed from patient to patient by the staff of hospitals, nursing homes, and other long-term care facilities. So in general, a hospital is a good place to go when you need to be there, but don't linger if you can help it. All right, well, let's take this understanding of the balance between internal and external uh, selection on diseases and the way it shapes them to think about how our relationship to disease has changed through the history of human evolution. If we turn the clock back 100,000 years, we would find all human beings living by a mode of existence known as foraging or hunting and gathering. This typically uh, is associated with small groups that are dispersed on the landscape. So the density of human population is very, very low. Um, they're highly mobile. They don't stay in one place. Um, their relationship to animals is primarily through their hunting and butchering and eating of those animals. And in this context, uh, we can imagine that highly virulent contagious diseases may have had a hard time. Uh, to the extent that they existed, they might have led to local extinction of these small groups of humans. And there's reason to think that this period of human evolution uh, was typified by a high rate of local extinction. But in general, the diseases that were more endemic might have been those with long latency periods, uh, with insisted or other uh, passive forms that could wait around for a long time, uh, or, and those that were very, very uh, low in virulence. Animal domestication brought a much more intimate connection between human populations and the animals they lived with, and particularly brought us into close contact with animals that uh, were derived from species that typically travel together in herds or flocks. And these are species that probably already uh, were hosts to endemic disease organisms that could be supported by the size of those uh, uh, herds and flocks. So more highly transmissible diseases could travel from animal to animal. And many of the uh, important diseases of our history uh, can be traced back 
to domestic animals, uh, measles to rinderpest, uh, chicken pox, blue, uh, uh, bird and swine flus, and a whole host of others. So the process of animal domestication uh, brought us some of our first highly communicable diseases. Agriculture and urbanization would have made the situation worse, uh, leading to even denser human populations that were settled, that were not moving so much, uh, so that now endemic infectious diseases could persist within urban populations. Agriculture may have involved irrigation, which would have introduced uh, water as a very potent vector uh, of disease. The development of better and better forms of transportation and long distance trade turned ships and caravans into vectors. And this graph just shows how the plague of the sixth century in spread around the Mediterranean carried primarily by the trade routes. This is long before the 14th century plague that killed off perhaps a third of Western Europe. Conquest and migrations of large groups of people carried entire germ pools, entire groups of pathogens from one part of the world to another, uh, often with devastating consequences, as in the uh, consequences of the uh, Western uh, conquest and invasion of the New World, where within a century, it's possible that 90% of the Amerindian population may have died. All of this process culminated with the Industrial Revolution, which led in the developed world of Western Europe and North America to the highest densities of human population that had ever been seen on the planet, and ever more effective means of long distance transportation of people, goods, and diseases. So that by the dawn of the 19th century and into the middle of the 19th century, Infectious disease of a highly virulent form became the primary cause of human mortality. More people died of respiratory and gastrointestinal diseases than of all other forms of disease, of all other causes of mortality put together. Adults died of pneumonia and diarrhea. Individuals of all ages died of pneumonia and respiratory diseases and gastrointestinal diseases. Children were susceptible to highly communicable diseases of their own, uh, whooping cough, measles, diphtheria. Then something amazing happened, something that is perhaps one of the most important changes in human biology uh, since the species evolved, an event known as the epidemiological transition. In a relatively short period of time, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, this mortality situation dominated by respiratory and gastrointestinal diseases changed completely. All of these highly infectious diseases, which were the major sources of human mortality, dwindled almost to insignificance within 100 years. Now this happened primarily in the Western developed countries uh, where, they, where uh, these diseases had become so uh, prevalent, but the causes of that change are not as obvious as they might seem. You might initially think that this was a triumph of medical technology and the development of drugs and vaccines that brought these diseases under control, uh, but that's, the real answer is not that simple. And as I show you a few examples, I also want to stress that it wasn't just that these diseases disappeared. For the most part, they didn't disappear. They were still there, but they became less frequent and less virulent. Even people who contracted them did not die at the same rates as they had before. So what was going on? Here are just some examples. Those, all that packet of respiratory infections caused a huge portion of adult mortality, perhaps a third of all adult deaths, uh, was down to a fraction 
of the level at which it started before any effective treatments were introduced. Whooping cough, a major killer of children, uh, had just about disappeared as a serious source of mortality before there was any generalized uh, immunization available. These are examples from England and Wales, but the same holds true with slightly different time frames uh, for all the developed countries of the Western world. Measles, we may not think of measles as a lethal disease, but believe me, it is. It certainly was in the 19th century, and it continues to be, uh, particularly in areas of Africa where I have done a lot of my work. But again, in the developing world, measles all of a sudden just became insignificant, not as a disease, but as a source of mortality, long before we had any effective treatment or immunization for it. Two of the scourges of the 19th century, tuberculosis and scarlet fever are portrayed here. These are the diseases that probably led to the death of Darwin's daughter, Annie, uh, which affected him deeply uh, and probably led, he says, to the loss of his religious faith and may have freed him uh, to develop his ideas about natural selection in a way that he had been inhibited to do before. But again, these diseases practically gone as sources of mortality by the time vaccinations and effective treatments were introduced. So what did happen? What caused these changes in our mortality profile as a species? Well, one of the most potent was changes in public health brought on simply by the knowledge of the germ theory of disease, just by knowing how diseases really were transmitted we changed our behavior in ways that affected the disease. This example, uh, which is one of the most, one of the earliest examples, sometimes thought of as the first example of a, of a major uh, modern public health intervention, resulted from the work of a physician named John Snow, who practiced in London and who was there during a particularly serious outbreak of cholera. He mapped all the mortality cases due to cholera in the city of London. Each of these rectangles represents a number of for mortality, a number of fatalities, not the size of a house. He mapped those. He then mapped the position of the sources of public water in the area and quickly zeroed in on the Broad Street pump. He brought this information to the town fathers and argued strenuously and eventually got them to close the Broad Street pump, at which point the cholera epidemic uh, resolved. As I say, this is thought of as one of the first public health interventions uh, in the modern world, but showed how changing the environment could affect the disease. Now, this is just an example of a whole change in attitude and behavior uh, that led to a number of public health measures and changes in personal behavior and personal hygiene, all of which reduced the probability of diseases transmitting themselves between bodies. So it tipped the balance of that scale back in the direction of uh, lower transmission probability and therefore lower virulence. Public health measures such as closing open sewers, purifying water sources, uh, securing food sources, introducing uh, the inspection of foods uh, for diseases, uh, quarantines of, in, and isolation of sick individuals. All of these changes, uh, both public and individual, probably helped to lead to the epidemiological tr transition that changed our experience of mortality changed it so dramatically that by 1967, the Surgeon General of the United States declared that infectious disease mortality was a thing of the past, that we could basically turn all of our medical attention to uh, chronic diseases such as heart disease and cancer, and just forget about infectious disease mortality. Uh, it may have been uh, an excessively optimistic position to take. The take home lesson I would like you to consider 
is that the kinds of infectious diseases we are subject to and their severity are largely consequences of our behavior, our social organization, the way we live, how densely we live, the way we move around, the animals that we live with, the way we treat our water, the way we conduct ourselves, the hygiene that we practice, these are the things that have a pronounced effect on the diseases that affect us. Okay, well, in the present day, the cards are stacked against us. If we thought things were bad in the 19th century, they've only gotten significantly worse in terms of the conditions that lead to the rapid propagation of disease. The human population has increased anywhere from four to five fold over that period. The degree at which we travel in space and carry diseases with us has exploded. So the number of air passengers doubled in the course of just 15 years leading up to the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. All of this means that the world we live in is a tinderbox for pandemic evolution. Our first taste of this was the 1918 flu in the modern world, but that was only our first taste. The graph on the left uh, is a hand-drawn graph by someone working in the Kansas Department of uh, Public Health, which shows that in between the middle of September and the middle of October in uh, Kansas, the rate of death due to flu, which is in the orange, orange line, rose not tenfold, not 20-fold, but nearly a hundredfold in the course of a few weeks. This clipping from a Canadian press report in December estimates, Please, I mean, yeah, I'm taking that. estimates the total number of deaths at something on the order of 6 million around the world. But the flu came back with a vengeance the following spring, the spring of 1919, uh, and eventually spread to virtually every population on the planet from Nome, Alaska to Easter Island, and may have killed anywhere from 50 to 200 million people. And that was before the population of the world got as dense as it is now, and the mixing and transmission uh, and travel of infected individuals became as prevalent as it is now. So what does all this mean for COVID-19? Let's turn our Attention to that. COVID-19, I'll just remind you, is the disease. The organism itself is referred to as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, so the severe acute respiratory syndrome of COVID of a coronavirus number two, uh, related to the original SARS that uh, had its outbreak in East Asia in 2008. What do we know about COVID? It's a virus, it's the first thing to uh, acknowledged, which means that it's a little package of genetic instructions that attaches itself to our cells, gains entry into our cells, releases that information into the cell where it then replicates and is transcribed by our cellular machinery into proteins that are then reassembled into more copies of that virus that then are released to infect a new cell. So it's a little uh, genetic instruction set that gets introduced into our cells, hijacks the machinery for replication and translation and produces more and more viruses. Now, the kind of genetic information that viruses can introduce can vary. Some, in, some viruses introduce DNA, the double-stranded uh, form of genetic information that uh, we carry in our chromosomes. DNA is replicated by a series of enzymes that include editing and error correction in their replication. Uh, it then gets transcribed into RNA, a single-stranded form of instruction that's to, specific to just one gene or one gene region. And that RNA is then uh, replicates and uh, is converted, translated into proteins that assemble new viruses. DNA viruses, viruses that introduce information in the form of DNA 
have slower mutation rates because of that error correction that's built into DNA replication. They have slower rates of internal propagation because the whole process takes more time. And they are associated with chronic diseases such as AIDS and herpes and Epstein-Barr. RNA viruses, in contrast, have much, much faster mutation rates because they're not subject to that error correction. They in propagate internally faster within the cell because they are introduced sort of midway in this production process. And they're associated with acute diseases such as dengue fever, Lassa fever, Ebola, and influenza. And finally, I'll just note that coronaviruses are just one family of RNA viruses, uh, but a family that includes some very important respiratory diseases, all of them uh, quite virulent and quite infectious, uh, such as MERS, SARS, and COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 uh, came to us from bats. This just shows the gen sort of family tree of a whole host of bat viruses represented by these gray circles uh, and the way in which they are related to each other. The blue lines just represent the, the error around the estimate of the exact time at which branching of this family tree occurred. Uh, the exact time of the branches is not necessarily known with precision, but the order and the clustering of these groups is uh, known with quite uh, good precision. This is SARS that erupted in East Asia in 2008, killed 800 people and paralyzed Eastern uh, markets, uh, brought a lot of international travel to, to a hold, caused Harvard to uh, refuse to let any of its students travel to East Asia for their summer internships and research. At about the same time, another virus made a jump from bats that developed into COVID-19. Didn't really start spreading until 2019, but probably jumped from bats at about the same time. It's associated with a cluster of diseases that jumped from bats to pangolins, but it is in fact derived from a bat. There was some confusion at the very onset whether COVID-19 came to us from pangolins or not but it didn't, it came to us from bats. It's just that pangolins got versions of similar diseases also from the same bats. So what is it about bats? This is just an aside. How come bats are so associated with bad diseases like rabies and COVID-19 and uh, any number of other diseases? And I'll just point out two things. One, bats are known, of course, many of them for roosting in very, very dense, sometimes very, very large populations. So they are themselves perfect species for spreading uh, highly contagious diseases. The probability of transmission is very high. And secondly, because of the physiology of powered flight, for reasons I can't, don't have time to expound right now, they have down-regulated parts of their immune system, particularly inflammatory responses. Uh, that means that they don't get as sick from the diseases that they are carrying as other organisms do. So they can carry them, they can spread them, uh, they don't get as sick, and in general, they make trouble for us. Okay, back to the coronavirus. The other thing we know about it is that it's uh, key, one of its key components gives it its name. The spike proteins that uh, emanate from its surface all, are, all around the rather globular organism that makes up the virus. These spike proteins are the things that actually attach to receptors on the surface of our cells. They attach particularly to something known as the acetylcholine colonies, acetylcholine esterase II receptor. Uh, and there's a very intimate attachment between this spike protein and the human cell receptor that it binds to. And the exact configuration of this part of the spike protein determines how well it fits and how firmly it attaches to the uh, human cell receptor. Binding to the receptor is what then triggers the entry of the virus into the cell. It's as if it has to grab the doorknob with a particularly sturdy grip in order to turn and get its entry into the cell. Now, this is the area of the virus that has been subject to uh, so much evolution that we have documented in real time. Uh, with the jump to humans, there was 
uh, a variant known as the alpha variant that uh, arrived very soon that had a better fit to the cell receptors than uh, the wild form and so rapidly became the dominant form uh, in the world. The now famous Delta variant has mutated even further uh, in a way that makes it particularly uh, avid in its attachment to the uh, receptor and changes the surface features that were targeted by the vaccines that are generated against the, that were generated against the alpha form and against the natural antibodies that convalescent patients who, who were sick with the alpha form produce. So it's, the virus has changed its spots in a way that make it more infectious and less likely to be controlled by vaccines or natural antibodies to be recognized by them. As a result, like our dark colored moth, the Delta variant in origin in orange here has rapidly become the dominant form in the United States and indeed around the world. Uh, this graph is showing between April and July. So in the course of three months, going from next to nothing to being the dominant form. It's that it has that much selective advantage over the other forms uh, that are being transmitted. Now, with this shift to higher transmissibility has come a shift to higher virulence. It's becoming increasingly clear that the Delta variant is more virulent than the alpha. Now you may have read that it's the, the vaccines confer, confer a good deal of protection. You're not as likely to get seriously sick uh, as you were if you weren't vaccinated. That may be true. I just ask you to remember that not all the world is vaccinated. And there are parts of the world that are likely to be overrun by the Delta variant that still don't even have vaccines effective against the Alpha variant available to them. So what do we do? Well, the good thing is we remember that our behavior matters. And a lot of the public health uh, instructions that we've been receiving, like wearing masks, social distancing, are, are the very things that can limit the transmission of the virus and tip the selective advantage back towards lower virulence. A lot of people seem to think that they wear masks to protect themselves, and if they do, and that may be true, it may confer some, some protection for you, but mostly what you're doing is protecting yourself from transmitting viruses to others not protecting yourself as much as you're protecting others when you wear a mask. What you may not realize is that you are also helping to tip the selective balance back towards lower, less virulent forms of the disease. Vaccines, of course, are part of the answer, but as we see, the, the organism can evolve exceedingly rapidly and is already uh, evolving away from uh, the forms the vaccines were generated to recognize. And therefore our vaccines are becoming what are known as leaky vaccines. They allow the disease to persist even in vaccinated people. And as the recent outbreak in uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts shows exceedingly high levels of viral load can develop in people even who received both of their shots and even who are people who are young relatively. Leaky vaccines are a problem. Leaky vaccines can act like filters that only let the most virulent forms of disease through. Much like our example of antibiotic resistance in the beginning, they can cause the evolution of only the most virulent forms. And this has been demonstrated in a disease of, of domestic poultry, particularly in you know, large scale poultry farming, Marek's disease, uh, which was very virulent in chickens. Uh, vaccines were developed that were highly effective, but not completely effective, and resulting in the evolution of more virulent forms of Marek's disease. New vaccines were introduced that just developed even further uh, virulence in the organism. So leaky, disease, leaky vaccines can be a problem. 
And that's what we've got on our hands right now. This paper hasn't even actually been officially published yet, but it uh, shows, it's a study that shows that uh, the Delta variant is not well controlled by our vaccines. Antibodies, sera that are generated from patients who've recovered, so naturally generated antibodies, are fourfold less potent against Delta than the Alpha variant, the previous dominant one, to which the vac to which vaccines were uh, produced and which most of these convalescent patients had. Sera from individuals having received one dose of Pfizer or AstraZeneca barely inhibited Delta variant at all. And even individuals who had had two doses had titers of antibodies against Delta that were three to five fold lower than against Alpha. So these are really uh, vaccines that were developed to, with the alpha form of the virus as a template and, and are rapidly becoming leaky to the Delta variant. As a result, short-term predictions, which vary all over the map, are generally rather pessimistic. We can expect that mortality is going to increase in the next weeks and months. Yes, particularly again, among the, those who are not effectively vaccinated. But just remember, there are a lot of unvaccinated people uh, who don't deserve to be left to that fate. Um, over the longer term, where have we got? I love this op-ed piece that appeared in the New York Times this morning from Ezra Klein. You know, we're just gonna have the, the uh, uh, this, this, spike protein stamping us in the face forever? Are we doomed? Well, to quote the famous philosopher Yogi Berra, uh, predicting predictions are difficult, particularly about the future. So I'm not sure, but if I had to hazard a guess, it would be that winter is coming. And I mean that both in the short term, we know that winter leads to the more rapid propagation of viruses. Remember last winter, we had a rather serious problem on our hands. The lower humidity conditions lead to more rapid propagation of the virus. I also mean that in the slightly longer term, the middle term, the virus is likely to continue to evolve to more virulent forms, as long as our leaky viruses and uh, uh, resistance to the appropriate public health measures uh, continues. And over the long term, I think we can expect that COVID-19 is just one pandemic organism, that events like this will likely continue to occur. Uh, our, our, the conditions of the world are just right for the continued emergence and evolution of highly virulent infectious diseases. So my advice to everybody is simply to stay safe, but also to keep your neighbors safe and to remember that your behavior as an individual and our behavior as a society really matters in shaping the future of our relationship with these diseases. Thank you. I'm gonna see if I can get out of this. There we go. And if anybody's still here and anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try to address them. Thank you very much, Peter. That was an extraordinarily um, insightful panorama, I must say. And uh, anyone who has any questions, um, please put them in the chat or at least in the chat, put your name and say, I'd like to ask a question and we'll find a way to, we'll spotlight you and you can ask your question. I have one to start out with. Um, I, I have been struck as most people have by the fact that the, the um, even our leaky viruses uh, and all of the breakthrough infections with the Delta virus, um, result in infections that are generally less severe than those of unvaccinated people. Could you just 
trace for us for a moment why the why these infections are less severe even though the virus is more virulent i'd love to do that although i think we don't entirely know the answer to that hmm. we know that the viral loads that can develop in people even in vaccinated people can be up to a hundred times higher than in the alpha variant and yet these people are not getting as sick. So that must mean that the, the vaccine is providing some sort of protection, if not to the actual um, transmission and replication of the virus within our bodies, at least to something that has to do with the pathogenicity of the virus. Maybe it has, maybe it helps interfere with the way in which um, antibody binding triggers inflammatory reactions. We know that one of the things that causes people to die from COVID is the very inflammatory response that our body generates. And controlling that inflammation is a key to uh, having successful uh, hospital treatment of someone that is uh, very seriously ill. And it might be that the, the, the antibodies that are either naturally generated or particularly those that the vaccine generates uh, may tone down our inflammatory responses. So just like the bats, we may tolerate this disease in a somewhat better way, but we don't know for sure. And it's a bit of a mystery. And I think there's a lot of um, effort being made to understand why that is so. Um, what we do suspect, and then there's increasing evidence of it, is that in unvaccinated people, this is a more virulent form. So although we may feel, okay, we're pretty safe because we're all vaccinated, so I may get this disease, but I'm not gonna die from it. Folks who aren't vaccinated, not only in regions of our country, but in regions of the world where the vaccine just has not been available, are increasingly vulnerable because of the virulence of this disease. And so keep that in mind. Don't worry only about yourself, worry about your neighbors. That's my Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions from other people in the audience? Um, I'm sorry that I asked the one that had no answer. But um, I'm always sure... easy to dodge a question by saying we don't know. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it is true. Um, Zoe Troutman says thank you for your welcome perspective. I look forward to reviewing the information again on the recorded version. Aha! So this was dense, and we will study it. How is that? Uh, ask one other question, unless someone else. Here we go. More are yet? Uh, I started thinking I knew about this stuff. The moths of the Industrial Revolution were familiar territory, and so was the John Snow cholera discovery. But then you took me to a new place with the decline of infectious diseases before vaccines, and then on to entirely new territory. Aha, uh -huh. very new territory. I think that's 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 the thing to to focus on. Uh, that that. And again, the key point of this talk, I guess, is that we evolve in tandem with our diseases and mm -hmm. that we infect the way they evolve, uh, and particularly in the way we behave and organize ourselves has a profound influence on the way those diseases evolve. Gene, um, uh, sorry, could I just follow up on what was a comment rather than a question in person? Please. So, um, so thanks, Peter. Um, so um, it, it was a, a little bit um, uh, depressing at the end, let's say, because there's no clear way forward. Um, I mean, are, are you of the view that despite the Delta variant possibly being more resistant to vaccines and more virulent, that nonetheless, the more vaccination we can manage both here for people who are for various reasons refusing it and in third world countries who don't have access um, that nonetheless is our best bet oh it's certainly it's part of the bet it's it's a very important part of the bet but the other thing i should have mentioned is it's now becoming increasingly clear that the protection the vaccines afford wears off the best estimates are that as soon as six months after the vaccination the antibody titers begin to fall and it will, wear off, it will wear off more quickly in the very populations that were most vulnerable at the beginning. Mm 
those whose immune systems are not as robust, including those of us who are older. So I think I we can we can expect. I don't know who you're talking about, Peter. <laughs> we can expect. I, I believe we can expect that COVID is going to be something that we will have to uh, have booster shots for, perhaps annual shots. Yeah. Like we have annual flu shots. Yeah, that's that's okay. very nice. Yeah. But then I don't think it's the end. I think yeah. there will be another one, and another one, yeah. and another one. Yeah. And our ability to control them is going to depend as much on our ability to control our behavior as it is on our ability to exert technological wizardry in the production and distribution of vaccines. Uh, part of that behavior is going to be, an important part is going to be developing the infrastructure and the, the collective uh, cooperative structures necessary to develop and distribute vaccines rapidly around the world as new diseases emerge. Uh, we've, the other is going to be to develop uh, more discipline in our practices uh, of our own personal behavior in ways that can help limit the spread of these diseases. So only if we can, if we can, these diseases are already highly virulent and highly transmissible when they appear. And they, everything about the environment suggests, it set, stacks the deck in a direction leading to further increase in virulence. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna to have to work consciously against that gradient if we're going to try to control it. I think this is a new world. This is a new epidemiological transition we are entering. Uh, some people have already called it the beginning of the age of a new age of pandemics, and I think they're not wrong. I think that's what there, we're under. There are a couple of related questions in the chat now that uh, Gene Stern says, is there any information that monoclonal antibody treatment is effective on the Delta variant? Hmm, I don't know. We just gonna have to pass that one. That's one beyond my expertise. Well, here's another one from Bob. Can mRNA vaccine development, production, and distribution get ahead of the virus's own evolution? Well, it's very difficult because even in mRNA uh, production, which is how we developed uh, at least the Pfizer and AstraZeneca and uh, Moderna vaccines, um, depends on having a template to work with. So you can only work with the viruses that you might have. You can manipulate them a little if you, if you can anticipate where you expect changes to occur, but you can't really, that's the thing about mutation, it's random. And we don't know exactly where the next mutations are gonna occur and exactly how the virus is gonna evolve. If we could, we wouldn't have to have these flu shots every year. I mean, the flu is also a coronavirus. It also mutates extremely rapidly uh, and uh, could take off at any time and become much more virulent than it is. Uh, we got very scared of the bird flu when it was first um, recognized in avian populations. Luckily, that one hasn't jumped to humans yet. Uh, but, you know, we're surrounded by these organisms that uh, um, don't really care about us. They only care about themselves. Well, they don't care about anything, but uh, they act as if they only cared about themselves. Has what we have learned about making making vaccines um, improved our chances in the future against these kinds of virulent infections? Yes, I would say in the short to midterm future, in the same way that our ability to synthesize antibiotics improved our ability to deal with bacterial infections. But mm -hmm. that ability has its limits. And, uh, you know, I can't remember what that, from, from that line from Jurassic Park is, uh, you know, but nature always wins. I mean, the, the, the ability of natural selection to generate uh, adaptive change in organisms is mm -hmm. much more potent than our ability to artificially generate vaccines. And in, in, organis in organisms, in bugs like RNA viruses, that can happen so fast. We're talking about a, a variant that swept the world in three months. Three months. I mean, how rapidly do you have to be able to generate vaccines to stay ahead of that wave? Mm. Wow. Well, 
There are two more questions, if we can get sort of short answers to them. I'll try. Call it a night. Are you willing to answer two more? Sure. All right. First, um, uh, Elizabeth Eames says, you leave us with the advice to protect your neighbors, our, uh, our neighbors, I assume. I would like to know your recommendations for how. I was dismayed that the Lewiston School Committee voted this week to not require masks. I'm dismayed as well. Um, I think we need to continue to take this very seriously. And, and I, it's, it's an interesting moment sociologically where I think people are having a hard time negotiating between self-interest and community interests. And as, as community-minded as they want to be, um, the way our brains work keeps sort of flipping, keeps evaluating the world in terms of self-interest. So without subconsciously, we just keep thinking, well, but I'm not at risk, or I'm not as much at risk, or I don't have to worry about this anymore. Um, and we forget that it's, if we take a larger perspective uh, and worry about our neighbors, we really do have to keep taking this seriously. Um, I don't know for how long. I, I, it's, it's as, I, as Yogi Berra said, you know, it's difficult to make predictions, particularly about the future, and we just, but all we can do is control our behavior in the present and do what seems to be uh, the responsible thing. Thank you. And last question, Jean Stern says, thank you for an excellent presentation. I have one other question. Do you have any theory of the significant drop in Delta variant in other countries, i.e., I believe, Great Britain? And India. India. Do you remember a few weeks ago, we were, we, all we read about was you know, the bodies piling up in the streets of India. And now it's just dropped to zero. Well, I don't know. Um, one, we don't know why the 1918 flu vanished either. One very serious proposition is that it burned itself out, that basically it infected everybody. And a lot of people died, and most and enough other people survived and were immune that it just lost its ability to transmit. We don't know the level of mortality in India. We have no idea. Uh, the, the Indian government doesn't know. And so it's possible that the Delta variant, variant really just ripped through that population in a horrific way and uh, sort of run out, ran out of bodies to bite, at least temporarily. We, we, we just don't know. That doesn't seem to be the case in England. So it, it's, it's very hard to say. But I think uh, in England, they keep reintroducing significant lockdowns that may have an an impact on the transmissibility of the disease. Well, thank you so much for taking us into as far as we can get into these mysteries. Can I make one one final thing, which is a little Please. bit of an anecdote of one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Bertrand Russell, um, giant of 20th century British philosophy, who was once invited by his um, colleague and mentor, Alfred North Whitehead, to give a talk at a gathering like this to a, to a lay population. And he decided he was gonna talk on um, the new quantum physics. And he gave his talk and he talked for 45 minutes. And then he stopped and he looked out at a sea of blank faces and thunderous silence. At which point Whitehead jumped to the podium and said, oh, I'm sure we'd all like to thank Professor Russell for that marvelous, uh, uh, talk, and especially for the delightful and insightful way in which he left unobscured the great darkness of the subject. And so I hope, if nothing else, I've done that for you. Do you, do you see our eyes twinkling in our little Zoom rectangles? Uh, not as clearly as I wish, but I, if, if it's happening, that's good. Well, bravo. Thank you so very much for taking the time. Pleasure. Talk to us about this Thank and you. help us all collectively hit our heads against the wall of um, human ignorance. But you've taken us into a lot more understanding. Thank you so much, Peter. And okay. thank, thank you. Thanks. Please come back for the next speaker who is um, going to talk uh, two weeks from tonight about uh, wit and wisdom, a community tradition in 19th century New England villages. There will be humor. <laughs> I can say, and uh, we'll know what was be, what people were thinking when they were putting together those connected farmsteads that are all around here. So that it's a little more local.
but goodness knows COVID is about as local as you can get too. So thank you very much again, Peter, and thank you all. Thank you to the library and to Dina for hosting this meeting. Pleasure. Good night. Good night.